بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم everyone and peace be upon you thank you for bringing your heart today I always like to thank um, I like I like to start my talks by thanking people for bringing their hearts because that's the most important aspect of yourself that you can bring to any space if you come with just your mind then you walk away with a mind that is full right but if you come with your heart and your priority is your heart, you walk away with a heart, a mind, not just a mind that is full, but a heart that is fuller, inshallah. So I hope that inshallah this conference is a means to making all our hearts walk away fuller, more nourished, more closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These spaces are really sacred and um, I'm very happy to be here with you, alhamdulillah. So this topic of Muslim identity is a topic that I'm sure many of us have heard over and over again, right? This topic is very important in our times today for valid reasons. And it's a topic that, you know, keeps coming up because the harms of not having a strong Muslim identity are great and vast. And we're seeing the harms of that, you know? As a psychologist, I see the harms of that, you know, especially with the youth. But also now with, you know, many of the, you know, Muslim adults and in older populations as well, is that, you know, there seems to be a disconnect between what we know is true and us feeling that sense of honor and strength and pride and also ability to walk this earth, you know, grounded, you know, in the times that we live in. And this is the struggle. This is a struggle that we're all going to have until the day that we leave this earth is how can we stay true to the values that we know are true, to the beliefs that we have claimed are true, that we have claimed to believe in, right? And walking in accordance with those values and beliefs. And so it's very important though that we begin talking about the concept of Muslim identity in a broader lens. Because I find that it's a little bit problematic when every time we talk about Muslim identity, we only talk about it in terms of you know, how we want to present ourselves. And I actually find that this approach is what's keeping us from making true transformation and changes. And so for me, what I like to do is I like to look at the psychology of what, of, you know, I like to look at our spiritual problems through a psychological lens. Meaning, I like to see what are the struggles that we're going through spiritually, and I like to see what are the mental and emotional obstacles that come between us and rectifying those struggles and walking towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I think when it comes to Muslim identity, what I find is that there is this disconnect between what our mind knows is true, because you see your mind can have awareness, you can have awareness about what beliefs are true. If I asked you who you are, you will say I'm Muslim, right? That's something you know. Now there's a difference between knowing on a mental level who you are and then feeling and experiencing you know, that beauty, that honor, that strength because of what you know. There's the difference between those two realms being connected, the mental experience and the spiritual and the heart experience, and, you know, and, and them being disconnected. And so what I want to talk to you about today is, you know, basically I want to get you to renew the lens in which you've been viewing yourself, who you are. Because that's what identity is. In psychology, identity is all the aspects that make up who you are. Your beliefs, your practices, your personality, your values. So today, I hope to challenge you to just shift the lens in which you've been viewing yourself and dig deeper. So with that, I want to kind of bring to your attention a few points before I give you three steps that I would love for you to keep in mind moving forward when it comes to, you know, walking this earth firmly, right? And having that sense of pride and honor as Muslims. And that is, when we approach the concept of Muslim identity, I want us to shift away from focusing on it as something simply that we have to present to the world. And I get it, there's a lot of pressure out there, right? I mean, the world and you know, society is constantly influencing us to be very conscious, more conscious of what we present to the world over what? Our internal experience. And so, especially as Muslims, right? We always wanna make sure as a community we present our best foot forward. And but aside from just the, our experience as Muslims, there's the whole influence of social media and the internet, right? There's this constant emphasis on present your best, your, the most perfect 
version of yourself, right? And that influence is there, and we have to recognize the reality of it. But it seeps its way into the way that we approach our spiritual struggles. So when it comes to Muslim identity, what do we do? We start with what is outward rather than what is inward. We start with how we, pre want, how we present ourselves to others rather than how am I presenting myself to God and to myself. And so I find what's problematic about our approach is that we're going outward to inward, but with change, with transformation, no change can happen that way. No true, long-lasting change can ever happen by going outward to inward. You have to start inward. And we know this from the Qur'an that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not change the condition of a people until what? They change what is in themselves. And so I want us to shift away from focusing on when we think, when you think of Muslim identity, I don't want the first thing that comes to our head as, you know, how am I presenting myself? Because in all of our minds, we have this image of what it means to be a Muslim. But today I want to challenge you to dig deeper and to think about how you've been viewing yourself. What does it mean to be a Muslim? For you to strengthen your Muslim identity, it comes from you living in line with your truths. You see, I don't think that the direct goal is I want to strengthen my Muslim identity. The goal is I want to live in line with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's truths and the natural result is that your Muslim identity is strong. And so shifting the focus, turning inward, prioritizing the internal experience, your experience that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees over what? What the people see. So this topic then does not just affect our youth. It affects every single person in this room, including myself. Because till the day we die, that is exactly what we have to do. We have to prioritize our experience with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over what? Our experience with the people. We have to prioritize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala seeing us over what? The people seeing us. And so, when we begin to know what our truths are, when we begin to live by those truths and that becomes our priority, naturally, you live those truths. That is what's transformational. In psychology, they say that, in the psychology of learning, they say that people learn the most from what is modeled. And you see this in you know, children, when you study the psychology of, of, of children, is that they learn most from their parents by watching what they do rather than what their parents tell them, right? So what does that mean? What are actions? Actions are the natural expressions of the truth in the heart. So a parent might say something to a child, but if that's not the truth they're living by, it'll show in their actions. In the end, the child will follow what the parent is exemplifying rather than what the parent is saying. But that is why, this, this, the, look at the power of the psychology of learning. That is why we have the prophetic example, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have just left us with the Qur'an, but he gave us a prophetic example. Because we, as human beings, no one is going to know our psychology or the way we learn better than the one who created us, designed us, and fashioned us, right? So, of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the best way in which we can learn lessons and live by those lessons, and it is by seeing and following an example. And that's why it's not enough for us to learn the Qur'an. We have to spend time learning the seerah and the way of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So it begins inward, seeking knowledge, and that's why the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, that seeking knowledge is an obligation upon every Muslim. Why? Because knowledge is truth. Knowledge guides you to the truth. Knowledge is light. Knowledge gives you clarity. It lets you see truth as truth and falsehood as falsehood. See, that knowledge is what makes a person stand firm. The more your heart is connected to truth, the less you will be swayed by what is false and what the people present to you that is not in line with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this process begins inward. So there is um, a thought in, you know, in psychology, there's different branches in which we approach you know, um, struggles. So there's like psychodynamic, for example, theory, there's cognitive behavioral theory. There's a school of thought called existential psychology. And I really like this school of thought. I feel like a lot of its concepts are, are in line with Islam and what it teaches. And so within this um, school of thought, there's an emphasis on tr living truthfully. And 
you know, there's a concept, uh, a phrase that they say, they say, you know, don't merely know yourself, be yourself. See, be is what? It's a verb, it's an action. Sometimes we think it's enough to just know who we are. But so, so a lot of times what we do is we, we know who we are and we fixate so much about who am I, who am I, who am I, rather than asking different questions. What are my truths? So I want to share with you three you know, key steps that we need to take that start with, that help you know, cultivate this inward process that will help us, inshallah, arrive at the natural result of being people who walk this earth firm, who walk this earth grounded, who walk this earth connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who walk this earth prioritizing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and feeling honored because of our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, feeling enough because of our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because this is what's being, you know, we're robbing ourselves from every day in this world. And the society is promoting this. Doesn't want us to feel enough through our creator. Doesn't want our youth to feel enough to be Muslim, to be people who submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is going to be our struggle till the end of time. And so the first step I want you to take is to ask different questions. So we're no longer going to ask, how do I strengthen you know, my Muslim identity? Or how do I present a strong Muslim identity. I want us to turn inward and ask the deeper questions. Do I know what my truths are? How many of us have sat down and reconnected with our truths, our beliefs? You know, what we believe about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what we believe about the path that he ordained for us, what we believe about what he has taught us, what the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has taught us. So, we begin by asking, do I even know what my truths are? When was the last time that I actually sought you know, knowledge? And not just like feel good knowledge, you know, watch a YouTube lecture and feel good and move on. I'm talking about sitting with the discomfort of seeking knowledge. Because seeking knowledge is not always I feel that high and then I feel good and I move on. Seeking knowledge, being a truth seeker, a seeker of knowledge is you sit with the knowledge. You take a little bit of time, you sit with it, you let it, you let it seep into your heart. You don't just, you're not satisfied with it just being on a mental level. So you ask different questions. Do I know what my truths are? And then what do I claim to be true? You know, remember, identity is made up of your beliefs. Like, okay, I, I'm claiming things, right? We are, we're always claiming things. In fact, the testimonial itself, the shahada, is a claim, isn't it? So what is a testimonial? You're testifying to what? To truth. You're testifying to a truth you claim to believe. So what do you claim to be true? When you say, I am Muslim, what are you claiming to be true? What does that mean to you? And then I want you to ask, you know, I want you as you explore your inner truths, maybe some of these truths come up that maybe are not in line with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have to ask yourself, are these truths in line with God? You see, we live in a world that teaches, you know, a lot of these self-help empowering concepts, but they make who the destination? Allah or ourselves? Ourselves. And this is something, a struggle of mine that I found along this path of navigating Islamic psychology was that when I would be immersed in the Western world, it, a lot of times the self-help material pointed to making the self the destination. The self was the master. But in Islam, that's not the case. So now, but this is causing problems even in the Muslim community because now a lot of the times what I hear is, okay, it's true to me, that's enough. No, you claim to be Muslim. That was your claim. You took the shahada. You testify to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being your Lord and Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam being his prophet and messenger. So it's not enough for you to say that this is my truth and that's it. As Muslims, based on our claim, based on our beliefs, there's an additional step, which is, okay, this is what's real for me internally. I might not want to wear hijab, I might not want to do this, I might not want to do that. Okay, but is it in line with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? It's not enough, I can't just rest and say, okay, this is my truth and that's it and that's okay because I am not the master of myself. And so, 
So we have to always do that additional check-in. Are these truths in line with Allah? It's okay to realize what your, nat what your truths are. We're human. It, this, there's no, this see, what I, what I hope to encourage myself and, and, and everyone always of is that I would like for us to practice less perfection and more authenticity. Less perfection and more wholeness. Perfection is not even real. It's not, we're never going to be perfect. But the key is to be aware of the reality of your inner experience so that you can direct it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and align it with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is what we're asked to do. We're not asked to be perfect, but we're asked to react to our imperfection in a way that is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then we find out about God's truths. Another question we should ask is, are God's truths enough for my heart? Is God enough for my heart? Is God seeing me right now enough for my heart? Is God being pleased with me right now enough for my heart? Or do I still need the validation of other people? Is me speaking the truth about my beliefs enough in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or no, wait, what are the people going to say? See, this is a muscle. You know, when I, te I teach this in a lot of my courses and programs, and I always say it's a muscle you have to build. It's not something that just comes, you know? It's something you have to build. The muscle of prioritizing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and letting that be enough. Letting what be enough? His validation of you. His acceptance of you. Him being pleased with you. Is that enough? Or will you continue to feel like you need other people's approval? You need the society's approval? You need society to, tell, to say that, oh no, Muslims are okay, Muslims are accepted. What, are, what do you need? Ask yourself these deeper questions. What are you looking for? What do you hope people will validate within you that you can get from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So is God enough for your heart? And if he's not enough for your heart today in this moment as you're asking yourself this, I want you to begin asking yourself, how can I, what can I do to make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enough for me, for my heart? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us the supplication of the people who came, the righteous people who came before us who said, Hasbunallahu wa na'mal wakil, right? God is sufficient for us and he is the best disposer of all affairs. God is, in other translations, God is enough for us, sufficient, same, same concept, right? Can God be enough in your heart? And then two more questions I want you to ask. How can I live by these truths each day so what I do is consistent with what I say I believe? Don't have to take big steps. You could start with, okay, I believe that salah is important. I'm going to make sure that I am consistent with what I say I believe. Start with the basics and work your way up. This is what, bring, this is what contributes to wholeness. This is what contributes to authenticity, which is very much related to wholeness. Because what's the opposite of authenticity? Hypocrisy. And isn't it interesting that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always warns us in the Quran about hypocrisy. But see, the thing is, I think that a lot of times we're so programmed to look at things as that's deen. That's spirituality, right? That's here. And then my mental and emotional wellness here. And then my life is over here. And my career is over here. And I, and I always say that I think one of the biggest things that contributes to people's struggles is this living in compartments. Where we have not com you know, connected the areas of our lives through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through the oneness of Allah. And this is the essence of tawheed, is that all the areas of your life come together and are connected through the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no my deen is over here and my mental and emotional wellness over here. They're always interacting with each other. So I think a lot of times, especially, you know, if we were, you know, programmed a certain way to view certain things and the way that we were taught certain things about Islam, it can contribute to this, I, this feeling of like, oh, well, that's like, that's Islam and that's, that's different than this area of my life. It's always interacting. You know, there's a reason why the concept of authenticity is so important in our world today. And there's benefit, constant, they're talk, constantly talking about the benefits of living authentically. Now imagine then, if you know you live authentically, but in line with the creator of the worlds, imagine the benefits. The mental, the emotional, the physical, the sakina, the serenity, the ability to walk this earth firm, the ability to walk this earth secure. Right? We all want that, right? Doesn't that sound like something we all want? What are we all craving internally? As human beings, we're craving security. 
We're craving security on a mental, emotional, physical, all levels, right? That's what we want, essentially, as human beings. We want security. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ready to offer us that. But we have to prioritize him. And so, in this first step, a final, and these are just suggestions of questions that I want you to begin asking you, yourself. I want to encourage you to dig deeper, to turn inward, rather than looking at your problems as, okay, how can I go out and fix them? No, turn inward. A lot of times, whenever we, we, we have a struggle, whether it's spiritual, mental, emotional, whatever, the first thing that a lot of times I see people do is go outward. But for you, if I, for you to go to point Z from point A, you have to first know where you're at. If you, if you contacted me and said, oh, can you give me directions to where, where, you know, where I'm at, I have to ask you where you're located, right? I can't give you directions to a place if I don't know where you're standing in the here and now, in the present moment. So whatever change, whatever transformation you want to make, it starts with turning inward. Us being strong Muslims, it starts by us turning inward. Yes, as a collective community, we have to always be concerned about how we present ourselves. But for us to be strong Muslims in this world, for us to be people who walk this earth prioritizing God, liberated from the shackles of the people, liberated from the shackles of society, liberated from people's expectations and feeling like it's enough, to walk this earth being people who testify to la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, that requires we turn inward because Allah does not change a condition of a people until they change what is in themselves. So it starts with me and you. And trust me, there's don't ever underestimate the power of one heart changing. Because why? What did I say earlier about how people learn? Modeling. The psychology of learning says that People learn the most from what they see others do rather than from what is said to them. So you want to make change? Find out what your truths are. Be firm in your truths. Connect to your truths. Feel honored because of those truths that are in line with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then walk those truths. And naturally you will be an example. That is the strongest way that you can impact change. And that is the strongest way that the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam impacted change. He was an example. So the final question is, how can I walk this earth grounded with my feet firm and my heart strongly connected to God and what is pleasing to him? And you know, when we study the seerah, we see this in the sahaba, don't we? In the companions of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We see this and we, we, we talk about them in such a way that we wish we were like them. You know, when we study Omar radiallahu anhu, we, we, we see his strength and his ability to distinguish between right and wrong and how his fortitude and his, how he prioritized Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how he owned himself. Because remember, identity is not just your beliefs, your practices, your values, it's also your personality. That's what makes up who you are. He owned who he was. He knew that he was not like Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu's personality. He owned that. You know, and that was something that always stood out to me when I'd be studying the seerah is how subhanAllah, the difference in personalities between, between the companions and how beautiful that was, but also how they owned it. And in fact, you know, they were given like uh, nicknames, you know, like whenever they, like, you know, uh, Khalid ibn Walid, right? Radiallahu anhu, he was Saifullah, right? Like he was a very strong fighter. He became called Saifullah. That was his nickname. So whenever a strength was recognized within one of them, they were given a nickname to, 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 to you know, elevate that strength, to encourage them, to, you know, to make them feel um, good about themselves, but in a beautiful way, right? It's not excessive. It's not in a way where it's, it's ego filling. It's actually making them feel honored because of something they're doing for the sake of Allah, right? And so we look at the seerah and we see this strength in the companions. And we see it, you know, I love Omar, he's my, he's, uh, he's my favorite companion because of, you know, his strength. And he talks about, you know, in one of, an, an encounter that he had, he talks about this concept of feeling honored, you know, through Islam. And so there is, um, there is, give me one moment. So Omar ibn al-Khattab, he was, you know, traveling to Asham with uh, Abu Ubaidah. And they came upon a creek, and basically he wanted to carry his, uh, you know, uh, take his camel across this creek. And so he stepped off the camel, and he, you know, walked the camel across the creek. But of course, his clothes, you know, wasn't, you know, as neat as before, right? So Abu Abaida says, you know, um, O commander of the faithful, are, uh, 
Are you doing this? You have taken off your sandals and placed them on your back, and you led the camel through the creek yourself. I do not think it will be easy for me to get the people of this country to honor you. Look at Omar's response. He said, Verily, we were a disgraced people, and Allah honored us with Islam. So if we seek honor from other than Islam, then Allah will humiliate us. Remember how I said that a lot of times when we think about our Muslim identity, we often start with how we present ourselves. We often associate Muslim identity, you'll seek, you know, we'll talk about Muslim identity in reference to our image. Here, what is Omar relinquishing? His image, right? He's not prioritizing his image because you see strengthening your Muslim identity is not about how do I look like to the people. If we start there, we have already lost the battle. You have to start inward. You have to prioritize how do I look like in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we do this even, you know, we're, we're talking a lot of, when we talk about Muslim identity, we're often talking about how we present ourselves to the non-Muslim you know, world, but we do this even within our Muslim community, right? We, sometimes when we think about when we, we have this idea of what religiousness looks like, like for example, when it comes to humbleness, we think humbleness looks a certain way. It means to minimize what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me. Because why? We're thinking this is what being Muslim looks like. So if someone compliments me, I have to say, no, 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 I don't have that. Instead of saying, that means what? You're prioritizing how the other person's looking at you and viewing you rather than who? Than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because what you just did was you, you know, minimize something that Allah gave you. Is that gratitude? It's not gratitude. So we do this on different levels. We definitely do it amongst ourselves within our own communities, but we also do it with, you know, when we present ourselves to the non-Muslim community. So we have to turn inward. I know I keep saying this, but this is the whole point, is that I no longer want us to talk about Muslim identity by starting with our image, our image, our image, because we hear this all the time. I want us to really start detaching from this you know, link or this shackle that we've given to society, that we've shackled ourselves to, and then you know, detach, liberate ourselves. And this is the essence of Tazkiyah. If you look at Tazkiyah, we always say it's purification of the heart, but in reality, it's liberating the heart from the shackles of the nafs or from the shackles of anything else that does not serve the heart. And that means anything else that does not serve your path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that was step one, asking different questions. No longer asking, how do I look in front of the people? How can I improve my image? How can I present, be, you know, stronger, look like a stronger Muslim? No. How can I be a stronger Muslim? How can I live with the truths that are already there to strengthen me, that Allah has already prescribed to elevate me? How can I just live with those truths so that I can naturally, you know, reflect the strength that comes by living in line with those truths? Step two, understand the power of truth. Many of us do not really understand how powerful of a value being connected to truth is. I mentioned earlier that when we talk about authenticity, the reason why there's so many benefits is because there's power in truth. You know the quote, the truth will set you free? It's very understated, but it's very true, very powerful. The truth is an act of liberation. And this is not a quote in just in, like, it's not a concept that's just taught in Islam. This is a quote that is universal. Everyone knows truth will set you free. This is why when someone lies, right, sometimes they feel that what? It's almost like they feel this heaviness. It's like they're in their own prison until what? They release themselves from that prison by doing what? Saying the truth. The truth will set you free. Truth is designed to liberate. So if we understand this concept then, truth will set me free. So truth is liberation. What is the most important value that we human beings across the world fight for? Freedom, right? We're fighting for freedom. Everyone wants to be free. But the most important freedom is the inner freedom. There are people who are in physical prisons who are more free than people who are not in physical prisons. This inner freedom is the most important value we can ever attain in this world. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us that. But truth is meant to liberate. Truth is also associated with light. You know, a lot of times, if you look up quotes about truth, you'll find several quotes where it's equated with light. But we don't have to look at quotes. We just look at the Quran. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala equates 
us getting the truth, getting guidance, as what? يخرجهم من الظلمات إلى النور, right? They're, they are brought out from darkness into light. That's what being guided signifies. What is light? Light guides, light make, helps you see, light gives you clarity, right? Light gives you hope. Light helps you distinguish between what is wrong and what is right, what is true and what is false. So truth is the most powerful, most important thing you can have in this world. And so if we look at you know, the Quran, we, first of all, if we look at everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent, essentially what he is sending is truth. And we look and we and and the reason why it was so powerful in transforming, you know, the the people at the time of the Prophet, ﷺ, that whole community, that whole, you know, that whole area was because they were living in falsehood. They were living in such a high degree, you know, in accordance to such a high degree of falsehood that when truth came, you know, it was easy to see how powerful and beneficial it was. You know, that's why a lot of times for me, when I need an iman boost, I go read revert stories. Because for me, you know, sometimes when you grow up, you know, as Muslim and you, you know, you, you kind of sometimes take the, the deen for granted, right? So for me, I like to read stories about people who came to the deen through with a fresh pair of eyes, who understood what it means to live in line with what is false and understood the power and the benefit, the liberation, the light, and the significance of receiving truth. And this is what I want to connect my heart and you to, is that we have to remember the power and significance of being people who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed to have the truth. So, you know, when people ask you, you know, what are you grateful for? A lot of times we're programmed to say, what? Well, I'm grateful for being Muslim. You know, just we're programmed. But do you really feel gratitude in your heart? And this is very much related to developing a strong Muslim identity. If your heart does not feel gratitude for being Muslim, for being people who have testified to the truth, and not just any truth, but God's truth, for people who have decided to live their lives in line with God's truth, then, and, and you know, we have to feel that gratitude for that. And if we don't, then we have to question why. We can't just... Be okay with lip service. My teacher used to always say when he would, you know, advise us to do dhikr, he would say, don't, you know, you know, Allah does not need your lip service. You know, meaning like be engaged when you're doing dhikr. Be present, be attentive, rec be connected to what you're saying. So we have to stop being on cruise control. If we are ever to arrive at the natural product of being people who, you know, live truthfully and have that strong Muslim identity, then we have to really dig deep and ask ourselves, do I feel grateful for being a person who has testified to the truth and for being a person who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed me with the truth? Because that is the greatest gift that you can ever receive in this world. And we see the harms of falsehood. Falsehood keeps you from receiving good. Falsehood keeps you from any long-term benefits. Falsehood depletes your energy, your resources, and then gives you nothing. It robs you of everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you, and then you get nothing on the path, and you get nothing in the end. Falsehood has harms that destroy lives. But shaitan makes falsehood look pretty, and truth look ugly. But if you look at a person in the desert running towards a mirage, what does, he, what does that person think? The mirage is real, right? And then they run towards the mirage. They think that they're going to get water when they arrive there. But what happens? Do they get water? No. And then what happens on the way? Their energy, their resources, the water, the little water they might have had along the way is all gone. They deplete everything Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us. So they lose on the path and they lose in the end. Falsehood destroys lives. Falsehood imprisons people. Falsehood keeps people trapped in the cycles of addiction on many levels. Falsehood keeps people from being liberated from the truth, from deriving the benefits that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to give you from the truth. There are benefits for you holistically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. So it begins with us remembering that we are people who were given the truth and we testified to the truth and we claim that we believe that this is the truth and we're going to live by this truth. So we have to connect back to that. 
and live by that and feel gratitude for that. But in the Western world, they talk about authenticity as something that is life-changing, right? Something that, you know, liberates people because they're finally, they, they cluttered out, you know, they decluttered the noise. They decluttered everything that does not serve their truth, that does not serve their path. Now imagine, brothers and sisters, if we did this, if we aligned our truth with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not just with myself and what I think is good for me, no, with Rabb al-Alameen, the Lord of the worlds. Imagine then the power, the benefit, the honor that you will get in this world and the next. This is what cultivates strong Muslim identity. And so, you know, there's a quote in existential psychology, which I mentioned earlier. They say that to become authentic, we, have, we require a thirst for freedom. We do have a thirst for freedom. Every human being has a thirst for freedom. But we forget the most important kind of freedom, which is the inner freedom. So I said before that the opposite of authenticity is what? Hypocrisy. You know, it's interesting because, you know, when they talk about authenticity in psychology, they talk about the opposite of it being self-deception. Meaning like you not being authentic is you lying to yourself. We all know lying is bad. Lying to someone else is bad and lying to yourself is bad. But many of us, you know, again, we, we focus so much on the outward, we don't think about how we're lying to ourselves. So it's interesting that in Western psychology, they talk about the opposite of authenticity as being self-deception. And I want you to, to you know, um, I want to share with you this verse from the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 9, uh, Fain would they deceive Allah and those who believe, but they only deceive themselves and realize it not. Self-deception. We're not deceiving Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already knows the truth. But we are deceiving ourselves. And self-deception is like walking on this earth with a mask. You know? That blinds you or a veil that blinds you from seeing what you need to see. So it's like you're a chicken without a head. You think you're going in a direction, you, th you, you feel movement, you feel like you're going somewhere, but you're not really going anywhere. And, so th and we see this in our lives, right? Those times where maybe we forgot about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then we find our efforts were fruitless. Allah gives us these signs, pay attention to them. These are signs to redirect, redirect, redirect. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, do not be like those who forgot Allah, Allah and he made them forget who? Themselves. You want to find yourself? Find Allah. Find yourself through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Find yourself through the one who made you. Do not make yourself the destination. Do not make people the destination. So truth is very important. So do you, are you starting to see how everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us is rooted in truth? And in the Quran, you know, I, you know, there's something so beautiful that always just overwhelms me, which is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even takes the time to tell us that he himself is speaking the truth. That's how much truth is so important, is that, you know, when you're in a loving relationship, right, you want the one you love to know that you're being truthful with them, correct? That's a value in a relationship, being honest with the one you love. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on several occasions tells us that he is speaking to us, you know, um, truthfully. And I just want to give you some examples of that. One second. Okay, I don't have that in front of me, but so several occasions, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps confirming, I am speaking the truth and what I have sent is true, you know, and I have sent it, sent it with the truth several occasions, open the Quran, look, and you will see this constant reiteration and confirmation of, I am giving you the truth, and I'm speaking the, the truth. Does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala need to tell us that he's speaking the truth? But that is love. That is rahmah. That is someone who wants, that is one who wants to be in a loving relationship with you and re reassuring you to believe in him. So he's telling you what I'm telling you is true. So there's a lot of harms to not living with truth. So step two is understand the power of truth and understand that your disconnect and living in falsehood is, has detrimental, detrimental long-term effects in this dunya and the akhirah.
This is why we are, we are taught to say the dua, you know, oh Allah, allow me to see truth as truth and falsehood as falsehood. And this is very much related to building, you know, to cultivating a strong Muslim identity because what we're dealing with is a lot of what is false in front of Allah, a lot, is, a lot of what is displeasing to Allah and what is false is popular. And a lot of, and what is true is not popular. So we're trying to navigate this world, but we want to be people who what? Prioritize truth, because technically, if you're saying I'm a Muslim, you're saying you are a person who prioritizes truth and God's truths. And so, so when we do, when we claim that belief, you know, we have, we live in, we live in a world where, you know, as we're navigating this world, we have to remember what we claim to be true. We have to remember that just because I see something and it's popular and it's accepted by so many people does not mean that it's pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But this goes back to starting inward and feeling like it is enough that Allah has taught me the truth, that I believe in the truth, that Allah sees that I'm steadfast in his truth. That is enough and Allah will help the believers. And so final step <coughs> is to prioritize your connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the akhirah over your relationship with the people and the dunya. Everything that I'm telling you will not have value unless you connect more deeply to the akhirah more than the dunya. Why? Because you knowing that world is real, you knowing that what you do in this path, in this world matters in a world to come, is what allows you to be steadfast in this path. You knowing that every time that you stood by what is true, that you, you know, asked to pray in your workplace even though you might get, you know, you risk getting fired. Every time you walked into a place with hijab, every time you spoke the truth, every time you stood firm by your beliefs, every time you did something pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, every time you pulled out your prayer rug and you prayed in public and you prioritize what Allah wants from you over what the people want from you, if you do not feel and believe in your heart that that action holds a value for you in a time and place to come, you will not be steadfast and continuous in those actions. And it will take just any little thing to make you sway. Because you forgot that what you're doing has a value that's in a place that is real, that is true, and it is inevitable. You know, it's interesting, you know, I want to remind you that, you know, subhanAllah, in Surah Al-Baqarah, in the first few verses where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us of the people who have taqwa. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim bismillahi rahman rahim Alif Lam Mim ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه هدى للمتقين الذين يؤمنون بالغيب ويقيمون الصلاة ومما رزقناهم ينفقون. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala begins these verses, the Surah Al Baqarah, by first of all reminding us that this book there is no doubt, meaning that what you're about to read is what true. What have we been talking about? I'm giving you truth. Again, a constant reiteration. I am the truth. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has called himself Al Haq. He has named himself the truth. Then he reminds us that way he's giving us the truth. He's giving us the truth. When these first few verses, he's telling us that there is no doubt. So whatever doubt you have, know this is 100% true. And then he tells us, that Guidance for those who have taqwa, for those who are conscious of Allah, for those who are aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But then he tells you who those people are. Ladina yu'minuna bil ghaib. Those who believe in the unseen stand up for their prayer and give out from, which we, from that which we have provided for them. I want you to ask yourself, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put belief, belief in the unseen before salah? When we know salah is like, right? So if you don't pray, you know, that's it, right? I mean, prayer is the basic, the foundation of everything as a Muslim. But why, why belief in the unseen comes before that? Because belief in the unseen is what gives life to everything else you do. You know, if you are disconnected from the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is looking at you, that's the unseen. Your prayer is not going to be alive. <laughs> if you... Are, if you forget that you have an angel on your right and an angel on your left that are recording your deeds, they don't leave your side, your sensitivity to sins will get lower and lower. 
Connecting to the unseen is something that is so important, so powerful. And this is why the Rasul when he would get up for tahajjud, he would say a dua, it's a long dua, but he would say that he would start out by him reiterating and confirming the truth. You know, saying like, Allah is true. You know, the messengers are true. The Quran is true. You know, basically reiterate, the angels are true. Reiterating all the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent that is true, and I really recommend you look up this dot. It's so beautiful. It just reaffirms your heart and connects your heart to what is real. Jannah is real. Hell is real. All these things are real, and it doesn't take away from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala's Allah Subhanahu wa Taala's love for you. That Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, it's in fact because of His love for you that He is telling you about these realities, so that when you get there, you don't. It's not like you hit a mirage. You get something. And you also get something in this path as well. So the three steps, ask different questions. Let us stop asking, how can I present a better image? Let us ask, how am I presenting myself in front of Allah and in front of myself, the person looking back at me in the mirror? Am I consistent with what I'm saying I believe is true? In authenticity, the actual definition is living in a way that is in, uh, con in, uh, that is consistent with what we claim to be true. Hypocrisy is living in a way that is inconsistent with what we claim we believe in or what we claim is true. So we have to muhasaba, check ourselves, ask ourselves, am I living in a way that is true? And again, we want less perfection, more authenticity. We're never going to be perfect. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees our efforts. The goal is that we are prioritizing truth because that is who we are. We started talking about Muslim identity, like the, the topic in the beginning, I was saying this word identity, right? It's about who you are. So this goal, this life, this path is about remembering who we are and living in line with who we are. You know, and this is, this is the ultimate challenge is that every step of the way, whatever struggle Allah gives you, whatever the world presents to you, whatever society gives you, whatever society influences you, remember who you are. And the reason, you know, subhanAllah, isn't it interesting in the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, اذكروني اذكركم, right? Remember me, I'll remember you. Why doesn't Allah say, know me, I'll know you? <laughs> right? Well, of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ta ta knows us, right? But remember means that you already know it. If I tell you to remember something, it means I'm asking you to recall something that I have already taught you. So Allah, we, the reason why it's called dhikr is because we're remembering truths that we already know that our soul already knows. And this is the path of developing strong Muslim identities. It's not about starting outward and saying, okay, how can I present the best image? No, it's about what are my truths? How can I live by those truths? And naturally, you become an example of truth on this earth. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us people who live in line with his truths, who prioritize his truths, who walk firmly on this earth, who, who, who he gives us the honor of being able to walk firmly on this earth with our feet rooted in the ground and our hearts connected to him always. Ameen. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Jazakum Allah khair.